father king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. Church, the tomb is empty. Come on, stand with us. Let's worship together. Come on. Hey. Come on, you have come. We said.
Hey, y'all, it's Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. So, so, so good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. You know, this is kind of like our Super Bowl Sunday. I'm talking like Chiefs beat the Patriots in the AFC Championship game, right? It was so bad, Tom Brady retired at halftime. We don't even know who we're playing, but we don't have any worries because we already know the score is going to be in our favor, right? It's that kind of setup. Like, yeah, we can go and go through the motions, but we already know who wins. That's what Easter's all about. And so we're excited to be here and to celebrate. If you are a guest with us watching online, what's up to you? Thank you for joining us. If you are a guest with us in the house for the very first time, thank you so much. Let's show some love to our first time guests. Thank you for being here. Let me tell you what I'm hoping for you today. I'm, I'm hoping that you have an incredible Easter, and what I mean by that is I hope that you get all the candy and you lose weight at the same time, right? I'm hoping that you have a great meal. I'm hoping that you see your favorite relatives. I'm hoping that the sun keeps shining, that you get to the end of the day and you take a deep breath and you say, that was an incredible Easter, right? But can I also tell you that I hope you experience resurrection? You know, it's a different thing. Easter is the celebration piece. Resurrection is the transformation piece. And so I want you to come in today, and I just want you to lean in just a little bit, right? Just a little bit. God only needs you to just come in just a little bit, and he's going to fill up the gap between here and there, and God's going to do something if you'll just open yourself up to listening to him today. Open yourself up to hearing from today. Easter Sunday might be a for real resurrection Sunday for you if you're open to it today, and that's our hope for you. And so let's just continue to worship together. Let's let God do his thing together. Let's express gratitude. Let's celebrate, okay? And let's not miss what God wants to do. Let's continue to worship.
no shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. You're coming after me. Come on, no one left out. We say, There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Yeah, that's it. There's no shadow, you won't light up. Mountain, you won't climb up. Coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. as the ushers make their way forward, we're going to move into a time of worship through giving. And if you're new here, there's no pressure to give because this service is our gift to you. As always, there's multiple ways to give. And as the buckets pass, we're going to sing one more song. We're going to sing Good Grace. So let's continue worshiping with our giving. Amen. We say, people come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one, and children of generation, of every nation, of kingdom come. Come on, a little louder. So don't let your heart be. Trouble no. and hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. And fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
comfortable can you stretch your hands to the sky as we pray father it's in the name of Jesus that we come before you God we thank you for being a good God we thank you for being a big God we thank you for sending your son Jesus for dying on the cross for our sins Jesus there's no name higher there's no name greater there's no higher name than yours Jesus we worship you we take a moment and we speak the name Jesus over every single situation that we're dealing with. Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, it's our prayer that you speak to our hearts today because we are here gathered together in church. And we'll be mindful to give you all the glory and all the honor and the praise. It's in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, church, shout amen. amen. Come on, shout a little louder, amen. amen. Listen, high five somebody before you take your seat. Thanks so much for worshiping with us. Happy Easter, and thank you for joining us today. When you walked in the service, you were handed a worship guide. Inside, you will find easy ways to get connected at Graceway and sermon notes to use during the message. You can also access the sermon guide on your smartphone by going to visitgraceway.org guide. We would love a chance to pray for you and connect with you during the week. In the seat back in front of you is a Connect card. Fill out the top portion of that card and our ushers will collect them at the end of service. If you're new to Graceway or want to learn more about who we are as a church, join us next Sunday at 12 p.m. for Growth Track. Growth Track is made up of four consecutive weekly experiences designed to help you grow in your relationship with God, connect to the church, and discover your purpose. Next, we are going to show you a video of Graceway's upcoming women's conference happening on June 7th and 8th. 
Again, thank you for choosing to worship with us on Easter. We hope you enjoy today's service. Happy Easter to you. Thank you so much for being here. You guys sounded unbelievable this morning. Did you have a good time? Man, I did too. I did too. I get to do it again. That's a, uh, that is a glimpse of heaven for absolute sure. So thank you so much for that. If you're a guest here, thank you so much for being here. Again, if you're watching online, thanks for joining us in this way. We're going to start a little bit different here today. Every Easter, at least since I've been here, uh, we put a survey in front of you guys, basically just because I know this is the one day I can pretty much predict y'all are going to come to church. Come on, somebody, all right? So thank you again for being here. If you would open up uh, your worship guide, actually in the, in the seat back in front of you, there's a connect card. There's a couple things that I'd love for you to just take a look at. Let me just walk you through it real quick before we begin, all of these very, very important to us. You'll see a spot for your name, email, all that, all that kind of thing. And the first thing that I want you to notice is just a spot for prayer requests. Uh, we're a praying church. Twice a year we gather for multiple weeks. We do multiple services in a row and we pray. Every Thursday our staff gets together. Every seat in this spot has been prayed for. If you are sitting in a seat, you were prayed for this week. And if you would honor us by putting a prayer request onto that card and dropping in the bucket at the end of the service, uh, I want you to know that that doesn't just go into a database of all the prayer requests we could have prayed for. That will go in front of our staff, in front of our prayer teams and our prayer groups, and your requests will be prayed for. I can absolutely guarantee you that. And so if there's something that you're needing God to do or say or stop or start, we would love to serve you by praying for you. Please put your prayer requests down there. The second thing that you'll see is if we were going to do another location, if we were going to do a Graceway someplace else, where would you like us to begin to pray about that? This is not a process that we take lightly. We want to multiply. We want to get the gospel to as many people as possible. But I don't want to sit in front of a map and say, eeny, meeny, miny, olatha, all right? And so I'd love for you to say where you feel like God is at work, where you feel like a grace way would best serve the community and God would be glorified. If you've got a spot like that, uh, you can put that down. If you don't, don't, don't sweat it, but would love to hear from you in that way. And the last two are what is a topic that you would like to hear about? When you read through the Bible, Jesus never says, turn in your Bible to. He takes topics, and he takes questions, and he kind of gets at the things that are on people's hearts and minds, the things they're struggling with. And so what is something that you would like us to open up God's Word and talk about and preach about and give you hopefully some grace and hope about? The second thing would be, is there a series that you would love to hear on? Maybe you want to hear on end times. Maybe you want to hear on prophecy. Maybe you want to hear on marriage. Probably not marriage. Fair enough. All right, we don't have to talk about that. Uh, but yeah, where's the spot that we can serve you best? If you would just jot that down, let us know. You see a couple options there. That's not all the options. Whatever you would like to hear about, we're going to do a series in the fall called You Asked For It, just to kind of get at some of those things. So if you would help us in that way, we would appreciate it. Are you ready to go today? All right, let me pray. God, we love you. Thank you for a beautiful, beautiful day. The sun is shining. It's perfect temperature. Thank you for every person who has walked in the room today, God. We have prayed over every seat multiple times. And so I pray for every person, for every struggle, for every desire, for every motivation, for every thought process, for everything that's going on in this room that I couldn't possibly know, but you absolutely know. I pray, God, that you would be near, that your spirit would fall, that you would work, that you would glorify yourself, that you would use your word, that you would change us for your glory and for our joy. We love you today, God. We thank you and we pray these things. In the name of Jesus, all God's people said, 
Amen and amen. Hey, get to Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 if you have a Bible or a smartphone. If you don't, you can watch it on the screen behind me. I've said to you many, many times that preaching is not a monologue. It is a dialogue. And if there is a better day for you to give a good hearty amen than Easter Sunday, I don't know what it is, all right? And so I'm going to try to give it to you. You try to give it back to me, and we'll see what God does in the middle. Can you dig that? Oh, come on. Are you kidding me? Two of you were like, yes. How about the rest of you? Can you dig that? Yeah. All right, much better. Thank you so much. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead, what's the next word? We talked about this, y'all, literally just 30 seconds ago, all right? He, he, he might, he'll think about it, he'll pray about it. No, he who raised Jesus from the dead will, will give life to your mortal bodies. Here's what I want to say to you today. Easter is not just a holiday to be celebrated. Now, I don't mean that to say that you shouldn't celebrate. I want you to have an incredible day. The weather, at least when I came in, was absolutely perfect. I'm looking forward to making calls to family and spending time with friends. I'm going to eat like a maniac, like it's running from me, all right? I'm going to have a wonderful day. I'm planning to do that. I might put an Easter bunny suit. I'm probably not going to put an Easter bunny suit on, but I'm going to eat a lot of Easter bunny chocolates. I'm just going to have a phenomenal day, and I want you to do the same. I want you to get to the end of the day, lay in bed, take a deep breath, say, I'm so full. That was awesome, right? I want you to celebrate, but I also want you to understand that Easter isn't a holiday to be celebrated. It's something to be experienced, it's something to be experienced. And so when the Bible talks about Resurrection Sunday, it's not talking about a day. It's not talking about April 21 or whenever it happens to fall. It's not talking about an event. It's talking about an experience. It's talking about a reality. It's talking about victory that is available, Easter power in dead and dying places. That's what Easter is about. Don't we all have areas in our life that are dead or dying, things we've given up on, things that we feel like that's never going to be fixed, it's never going to be better, it's never going to be what I hoped. I thought it was going to be awesome, but it's turned out to not be. I've got regrets, I've got embarrassment, I've got difficulty, I don't know what to do. Easter is the answer to that. Easter closes the gap between what it could be and what it is what it could be and what it is. My marriage is cool. It could be better, but, but it's not. My relationship to my kids, it could be, but it's not. My finances could be, but they're not. My relationship at work, it could be, but it's not. I don't, and I don't know how to close the gap. I've tried to close the gap. I've been disciplined. I've been moral. I've been ethical. But every time I get up, it just the same struggle is there. How does that gap get closed? How do I get more power? Easter is where that power comes from. Resurrection is where that power comes from. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about Easter. It's, it's kind of an arbitrary thing at some level. Jesus dies whatever day he died, and then he is in the tomb for, for three days. Have you ever thought about why three days? Like, why not ten days or seven days, right? Why not he just dies and then it's like, whoo, right back, and just, ah, I thought you got me. No, it didn't work, right? <laughs> Why, why did he just go through the process of going to the tomb, of laying there for three days? Why three days? First Peter 2 and verse 21 says this, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. What does it mean to follow in the steps of of Holy Week, of resurrection. What does it mean for us to experience the reality of Easter? That's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and why it had to go that way and what God wants to teach us through it. Are you ready for it? I tried to tell them that they needed, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work. Maybe we should just stop. <laughs> Are you ready? Okay, come on, it's Easter. At least fake being excited, okay? I'm excited. Here we go. Friday. Friday is a day of pain. Friday is a day of pain. Now, this sounds weird to say. I love that Jesus experienced pain. 
I absolutely love that Jesus could have stayed up. You know, you, re you read through mythology and the gods are always up there somewhere. They don't experience pain. They don't experience discomfort. They don't experience difficulty. Our God moves into our neighborhood and experiences pain. He could have moved into our neighborhood and just been in a bubble, but he experiences pain the way that you and I do. You know, Jesus experienced pain physical pain. I want you to think about this. Jesus could have come to the earth at any time that he wanted. If he had come in the 2000s and he had experienced capital punishment, he would have gotten lethal injection. He would have laid down on the bed, they would have put a needle in his arm, and he would have gone to sleep permanently. But he chose to come 2,000 years ago at one of the most brutal times in human history when it came to capital punishment. The Persians invented crucifixion the Romans, they perfected it. They had been using it to make a political statement to humiliate anybody who would rise up against them. They were expert in killing you in the worst possible way, and God and his sovereignty sends his son in that time period. Why? So that you would know that Jesus knows what it feels like to suffer. Some of you would know that Jesus knows what it feels like to be in pain. Some of you right now, you're, you walked in the door, and I'm glad that you're here, but you're in pain, physical pain right now. You've got a doctor's report that's not good. The medicine's not help helping. The medicine hasn't kicked in yet. The report, the prognosis isn't good. Does God know what it feels like for me to experience this? Yes. Yes, he does. He, he knows what it feels like to experience physical pain. God knows what it, it feels like to experience emotional pain. Do you know that the title that the prophet Isaiah gives him in Isaiah 53 is man of sorrows? Man of sorrows? What do you mean man of sorrows? Why not man of victory, man of dominance, man of all power, king of kings and lord of lords? No, man of discouraged, man of depressed, man of difficulty. The Bible says that Jesus experienced joy and anger and frustration and exhaustion and sadness and compassion. Jesus experienced all of the range of emotional difficulties. If you're in here today and you're struggling with melancholy, you're struggling with depression, you're struggling with mental health, you're struggling with feeling like you can't get on top of your own soul, does God know what it feels like? Yes. God knows what it is to be a man or a woman of sorrows to be discouraged, to wake up and for no reason feel depressed. God knows what it feels like. God exposed himself intentionally to that difficulty and to that struggle. And then how many of you know that Jesus had relational pain? Come on, somebody, with the relational pain. Wouldn't family be great if it weren't for your family? I mean, I like the idea, it's just the actuality. <laughs> it's just not, I don't like it at all, right? Now, wouldn't you imagine that if Jesus was born into a family. Jesus was the firstborn of Joe and Mary. Probably was a pretty good kid, right? Probably from time to time did some crazy things. His brothers and his sisters would have seen that. He would have never asked them to pass the salt. He just would have gone like this, Boop, right? At bath time, he's like, I don't want a bath. And he walks on top of the bath water, right? It just, like he had done all these things to give evidence to his reality. You assume that his family above all else probably had his back, right? probably believed in him, probably was campaigning for him, like Jesus' face with hope and blue and red, right? Like, I, I just, I assume that they probably were into Jesus. They knew what was up for him. But you know, in John chapter 7, the Bible says that his brothers didn't believe in him. Can you imagine you're Jesus, you're God, you created these fools, and they're like, I don't think so. I, I don't think you, I don't think that you're God. I don't think you are who you say you are. I will kill you, Right? No, he does But imagine just the difficulty of that. In Matthew, or in Mark chapter 3, the Bible says that his family told people that he was crazy. That he was crazy. John chapter 1, he came into his own, and his own did not receive him. Some of you, you're going to go to lunch today, and you're going to go be with family, and it's going to be the loneliest part of your day. It's going to be the most stressful part of your day. It's going to be the most tense part of your day because of who's going to be there. And it should be better, and they should care more, and they should stop, or they should start. That should be a wonderful time, but it's not. It's broken. Jesus knows what it feels like to be rejected by his family. Jesus knows what it feels like to struggle with emotional pain. Jesus knows what it feels like to have physical pain. So what does God have to say about it? Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 says this, and we know, we know, 
For those who love God, all things work together for good. You're trying to tell me that this physical pain that I'm going through, that God has a purpose for it? Yes, I am. I'm trying to tell you that. You're trying to tell me that my depression, that God wants to use my depression for my good? Yes. You're trying to tell me that my mother-in-law, maybe not your mother-in-law, okay? <laughs> That's not it. Yes, yes. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. You say, how could you possibly know that my pain is purposeful? Because Jesus suffered to save you. That's how I know. Jesus could have chosen an easier way. Jesus could have gone the simpler path. It could have been more efficient, but Jesus went the most painful, the most difficult, the most bloody, the most shameful to save you. There was a purpose to his pain. Don't you think that if God would send his son to that suffering, he can use your pain for his purposes? Yes, of course he can. There is no pain that the purposes of God cannot redeem. There is no pain that the purposes of God cannot redeem. Now, let me be clear with you. The enemy, he wants you to get stuck. He wants you to get stuck in your pain. He wants your reality to be your pain. He wants you to see every experience and every relationship through the lens of your pain, your struggle, your difficulty. Jesus says, I want you to follow in my steps. Don't, don't get stuck. Trust me in the midst of it. Trust my purposes in the midst of your pain. I came to this earth. I experienced it. I went through Friday, this day of pain, so that you would know that I'm near to the brokenhearted, so that you would know that I've been there, that I've done that, that I wore out the T-shirt, and that I'm bigger than it on Easter Sunday. I need you to hear that today. I need you to hear that today. Day two is Saturday. If Friday is a day of pain, Saturday is a day of confusion, isn't it? It's a, day of, it's a day of confusion. I want you to imagine the disciples. The disciples have left their jobs. They have literally tied their wagon to this guy by the name of Jesus. They have believed him hook, line, and sinker. They've done everything for the most part that he's asked them to do. They've sought to follow him. They've sought to believe him. They've sought to trust him, and then they watch him get murdered. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight, and we're like, Jesus told them that he was going to rise again. Jesus said to them, the temple, three days, and all that. But it's clear that they didn't remember or that they didn't understand that it was going to be this bad. It was going to be this bad. And they were afraid, and they were confused. Now, it, it, no matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian, the reality of it is, is that you have questions that you don't have answers to, right? I mean, let me just give you a couple. Um, are eyebrows considered facial hair? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, I'm all about facial hair because I'm not about actual hair, but I don't know if this counts, right? It's a question that I have. I mean, here's another one. Is it illegal to park next to a fire hydrant if your car's on fire? I don't know. I don't know if that's happened to you. If you could let me know, just send me an email, maybe a quick text. How about this? Uh, why do your feet smell and your nose, why does it run? I mean, it feels like it should be opposite. I don't know. I don't know the answer. You know, you've heard people say, that's the best thing since sliced bread. Well, my question is, what was the best thing before sliced bread? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the, what the best thing. I mean, apparently sliced bread is better than that. It like went up the ladder against it. I don't know. We'll never know. How, how about this? If pros and cons are opposites, wouldn't the opposite of progress be what, Congress? <laughs> Okay, on that one I do know. Yes, the answer is <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah, I'll have to edit that one out. That one that we know the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought maybe you needed to laugh just a little bit on Easter. Let me give you some real ones. Why does this keep happening? No matter what I do, no matter what I change, no matter what I read, no matter how much I pray, this keeps happening. And when it comes to prayer, I mean we got a lot of these. And I prayed, I prayed on my knees, I prayed standing up, I prayed with my hands in the air, I prayed with my hands behind the back, I came to prayer night, I put my post-it note on the wall, why didn't you answer me? Why do I feel like my prayers hit the ceiling, fall down, just roll around on the ground? Why did you let it happen? I mean, why, why would you let eight bombings, most of them churches in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday, I mean, why would you let that happen? Why, why would you let them die? They loved you. They were trying to do good things for you. They got sick. I believed that you were going to heal them, and I buried them. Why'd you let me fail? 
You knew I didn't want to. You knew that I was weak. I, I prayed the Lord's Prayer, keep me from temptation, all that kind of thing, but I, I don't understand. I don't understand why certain things happen. I don't understand why you let things go. I don't understand why you don't listen. I don't understand why you didn't do it. And in a season of confusion, here's the thing about confusion. The worst part about confusion is the waiting. It's not that I don't know, but it's the fear that I'll never know, right? And in that season, we want answers. Now, our answers, generally, God's already told us something, and we just forget. That's what happened to the disciples, right? I mean, Jesus said, I'm going to die and rise again. They just didn't know it was going to be that bad. They just didn't know that it was going to feel that way. And as soon as Jesus died in that way, they forgot what God had said. Now you look at that and you say, that's ridiculous, but you've been there. You've had things that have happened that you've raised your fist to God. How dare you do this to me? How dare you let this happen? You know Romans 8, 28. You got a coffee cup with it on it. You know that God says, even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be with you. You know that God's good and faithful and kind. You know that the God that created the heavens and the earth will be glorified and his glory and your joy are the same place. You know that. God already told you, but you still want answers. On Saturdays, this day of confusion, on Saturdays we want answers, and on Saturdays we begin to doubt. Peter is probably my favorite disciple just because he's a professional knucklehead, right? And I resonate with that deeply. But probably my second favorite is Thomas, because Thomas, Thomas is a little too honest. Jesus comes in to where the disciples are hiding out. He literally comes through the door, and he's standing there, and the disciples are like, Jesus! And Tom's like, uh-uh. I ain't falling for this. I ain't falling for this hoax. I got to put my hand in your fingerprints I got to see it for myself. And here's what I love that Jesus doesn't do. Jesus doesn't say, every time I turn around, your stupid self is asking me dumb questions. Every time I turn around, Thomas, I mean, for the rest of time, they're probably going to call you Doubting Thomas. <laughs> You're so stupid. He doesn't do that. He's like, go for it. And this is my favorite part. Thomas doesn't. He's like, okay, now let me see the side. <laughs> He literally puts his, his finger, comes through, and he's like, how about the side? And Jesus is like, go for it, big boy. <laughs> but in seasons of confusion, while we're waiting, looking for answers, don't you begin to doubt everything, even the most obvious things? And we begin to feel alone. The disciples, they huddle in a room together. They're afraid. They aren't going to the grocery store. <laughs> they aren't on social media. They aren't Instagramming themselves. They're afraid, and so they isolate, don't you? In seasons of confusion, you kind of pull away from community. You pull away from the presence of God. You pull away from what God has said. And literally, most of the time, if you go long enough, confused enough, waiting for too long, you just want to give up. You just want to give up the whole thing. This is literally what Peter did. Jesus dies, and in John 21, not that long later, Jesus comes looking for Peter, and Peter's fishing. You say, oh, he's trying to blow off steam. No, he went back to his old job. And when Jesus is on the shore calling out to Peter, hey, you catch anything? He's not talking about the fishing. He's talking about his vocation. You gave up this easy, Pete? And the reality of it is, yes, because I needed you to do something, and you did the opposite. I needed you to speak, and you didn't. I needed you to be powerful, and you weren't. I asked you, and you ignored me. In Psalms chapter 73, David David wrote most of the Psalms, but he had a worship leader by the name of Asaph. It's not as cool as Brandon Estelle, but we'll go with it, all right? <laughs> and Asaph wrote a Psalm, and he's kind of evaluating the world around him. He's evaluating one of the big whys. Why do the bad guys keep winning? Re like, really, God, you, did, like, you didn't know they were going to do that bombing? You didn't know those terrorists? You didn't know that dictator? You didn't know... And he's looking around, he said, now when I thought to understand this, thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Haven't you been there? I can't watch one more clip of news. I can't take one more election. I can't. I can't do it. I'm, they, like, there is no good answer to how stupid this is. Look at what he says. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned 
their end. Then I discerned their end. There is no confusion that God's presence cannot calm. The season that my wife and I had before we came to Graceway was honestly one of the hardest seasons of my life. Sometime when I'm more free to tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you kind of the details of it, but I, I will tell you I listen to more worship music in those three months than I have up until that point and even probably since. And, and what I found is that in some way, shape, or form, getting into the presence of God through worship, getting into the presence of God through prayer, getting in the presence of God through his word, it calmed my soul. Now, don't confuse hope with answers. Don't confuse hope with answers. This isn't about what, this is about who. And you might find out that you get the answer that you thought that you needed and you're still as desperate as before. This is about who you're going through it with. This is about the valley and whose hand that you're holding. The enemy wants you to get stuck around your wise. Please listen. The enemy wants you to get stuck around your wise. Your questions are still bigger than God. It doesn't mean that when you become a Christian that your questions go away. It just means that God is bigger than your questions. It means that when I get into the presence of God, it doesn't mean that I don't have fears. It doesn't mean that I'm not concerned, that I'm not confused, that I don't have pains. God never says, act like those things didn't happen. He says, let me do them with you. Let me do them with you. The enemy wants you to get stuck in this. Jesus says, will you follow in my steps? Will you follow in my steps? Will you let me do it with you? Will you believe that my presence is bigger? Will you believe that my purposes is big, are bigger on this Easter Sunday? Now, here's the thing that's incredible. For some of you, your life, you're in Friday. You're in Friday. You're experiencing pain. You're stuck in pain. Your reality is pain. You have relational pain, emotional pain, physical pain, spiritual pain. It's just what's happening right now. For some of you, it might be Saturday. You're in a season of confusion. You're in a season where up is down and down is up and right is left and left is right. But can I tell you that you're one sunrise away from your life turning around? Amen. You're one sunrise away from God showing up in a different way. doesn't mean that God isn't with you now, but for some of you, you just need one more sunrise to get into Sunday. You see, Friday is a day of pain. Saturday is a day of confusion. Sunday is a day of resurrection. Sunday is a day of resurrection. Christianity is unique in this regard. Most religions do a span of time and multiple people. We don't do that as Christians. We look at one dude on one day, right? And it ain't Friday. We don't look at Friday and hang our hat on Friday because if Jesus died and he stays dead, he's just like all the other dudes and dudettes who are dead. He just died in a terrible way. That doesn't save you. That doesn't set you free. You don't celebrate death. You celebrate resurrection. So we look at that dude, Jesus, on this day, Sunday, resurrection day, and we say, I hang not only my life, not only my pain, not only my relationships, not only my confusion, I hang my eternity on that dude and on that day. It doesn't mean that I don't have questions. It doesn't mean that I'm not confused from time to time. It doesn't mean that I don't have pain. It means that I know who wins. It means that the game's still being played, but I know the last score. It means that I know that at the end of time, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, every tongue, tribe, and nation is going to stand victorious over his creation as a resurrected Savior. You say, man, if that were true, <laughs> if that were true, I, 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 might, I might be interested. How do, how do I get some of that? So let me tell you. Let me tell you. There's a story. There's another resurrection story in, in the Bible. It's not about Jesus. Jesus is involved in it, but it's a guy by the name of Lazarus. Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha, and Lazarus gets sick, and Mary sends off a text. Hey, Big J, <laughs> little L, it's not feeling so good. It'd be cool if you'd swing by. Maybe bring some mucinex or something, right? <laughs> and Jesus gets it, and he waits. Now, that's confusing. That's painful. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. For, for you to be capable of doing something, know that something's happening, and wait for it to get worse. And the Bible says that Lazarus dies, and that Jesus waits not the next day, not the day after that, not the third day, it comes the fourth day. Like, this cat is for real dead. Like, there's nothing left to do. Like, they don't even want to open up the tomb because the brother's stinking so bad. 
And then Jesus comes staunchering up with like a big gulp, like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> how's it going? How's it going is that you could have fixed this and you didn't care. How's it going is that now he's dead and it's broken, never to be reversed. How's it going? Thanks for showing up. No thanks. And listen to what Jesus says. Jesus said to her, I love this, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm not talking about a day. I'm talking about a person. Whoever believes in me, even if it's dead, you're dead, they're dead, it's been dead, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Here it is. Do you believe this? Do you, <laughs> do you believe this? Here's what the Bible says. There is no death that his power cannot resurrect. You say, you're trying to tell me that all the crazy stuff that I did in my, I mean, like, I mauled my past. I did stuff that I hope nobody, I'm still living in the carnage of the decisions that I made in my past. Are you trying to tell me that if I just surrender my life to Jesus, that Jesus is bigger than my past? You bet your butt I'm telling you that. I don't even know what that means. I don't know what bet your butt means. But that's what I want you to do, all right? You're trying to tell me my relationships? I've been sideways with my spouse since the day we said I do. When I said for better or worse, I didn't know it would only be worse. <laughs> You're trying to tell me that if I give my life to Jesus, that God has a purpose in that pain, that the confusion that I've experienced, that he's bigger than that in his presence, and that he can and intends to rest. Are you trying to tell me that God's that big? Yes, on Easter Sunday, I'm trying to tell you that. My joy has been gone. I don't even remember. My faith has been gone. My hope has been gone. It's all been gone. He's trying to tell me that God, the same spirit that resurrected Jesus, is available to me to bring back to life the things that I have murdered and killed and mauled and destroyed, the things that have been stolen from me, that God wants to give me abundance back on that. Yes, that's what I want to tell you. That's what I want to tell you. Now, the enemy, he wants you to stay stuck. He wants you to stay stuck in your brokenness. He wants to say, this is so bad, this could never be fixed. You know this could be, never be fixed. If it could have been fixed, you would have fixed it a long time ago. You read that book. You went to that conference. You listened to that podcast. You said those words. You prayed those prayers. If God really cared, he would have done something about it. He wants you to stay stuck in your brokenness. God wants to save you and set you free. That's why he was willing to suffer. That's why he says, come into my presence even when you're confused. That's why he laid in the tomb for three days. Maybe you're in here and you say, honestly, it's not one particular thing, but I don't really feel like I have purpose. I don't have hope. I don't have joy. I don't have a lot of things. Then I want you to just in the next couple of minutes do some business with God. Maybe you've been coming to church for years. Maybe this is your first Sunday. I want to ask you to pick up that Connect card that we gave you on the front end. And I want you to look at the bottom of it. And I need you to just be respectful that I think that God has some things that he wants to say. So I need you to just be still. And I'm going to ask you to do business with God in a tangible way. And I'm going to ask you to respond to Easter Sunday. If you look at the bottom, you're going to see five responses. I just need you to pick one. Everybody in here, whether you've been coming to Graceway since it started or this is your first Sunday. Maybe you're in here and you say, there are some things that are broken. It's true, but I feel like I got it, and I don't ever plan to have a relationship with God. Then I need you to check that box, and I appreciate, I appreciate your candor. I appreciate your, your strength. I'll tell you, if it were up to me, I need help. <laughs> I need a Savior. But if that's not where you are, then I want you to check that box. Maybe you say, I'm, I'm open to this. I am. It, it, it makes some sense to me. But I need some more time to think about this. If that's where you are, then I need you to check the bubble right underneath. Maybe you say, here's the deal, I still got questions. But I feel like God is talking to me today and I wanna accept a relationship with him or I wanna recommit. Maybe you prayed a prayer a long time ago. Maybe a lot has happened between then and now. And today, April 21, Easter Sunday, you say, I wanna recommit or I wanna begin if that's you, I want you to check that bubble. If you're in here and you say, I already have a relationship with God. I've seen him be faithful. I've seen him resurrect things. I've seen him change things. I already have a relationship that I want you to check that bubble. 
And lastly, if you say, I'm a Christian, but I've never proclaimed that through baptism. I'd like to get baptized. In two weeks, we're going to celebrate our birthday, and we're going to baptize a lot of people. It's going to be a phenomenal day. If you'd like to be connected to that, I'd love for you to check that bubble. But I want you to just take a couple minutes. I want you to tune me out. How about that? A preacher who says, tune me out. And I want you to just listen to the voice of God. This has nothing to do with me. This has nothing to do with who's beside you. This has to do with what God's saying to you. And whether or not you're going to listen. And so we're going to sing another song. And as we sing that song, I want you just to, to think and maybe pray. But more than that, I want you to listen. And I want you to check one of those boxes. The ushers are going to come. They're going to collect all those cards. But I'm going to have you stand up. And let's close out our time together singing praise to God.
Thank you so much for being here. We're so honored that you would join us. In two weeks, we're going to celebrate our birthday. We're turning 76, y'all. It's going to be awesome. We're going to throw a big old party. We're going to baptize a bunch of people. To my knowledge, for the first time in 76 years, Graceway is releasing a worship album. Our team's worked incredibly hard on this. It's really, really, really good. I think that you're going to love it. In fact, I got one copy right here. First person up here gets it for absolute free. Look at her. She's running. I like her. Future worship leader right there. Hey, we're so honored that you came. Thank you so much. We got a gift for you. Everybody in the house gets that album. Listen to it. Enjoy it. Share it. We love you so much. Happy Easter. Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us today. We are super stoked to announce our new album, One Savior, is available today. So you can go to gracewayworship.com to download your free copy, or you can stream it on Apple Music or Spotify. We hope you enjoy it.